That's, uh, that's a complicated topic, as we all know. You know, agriculture mm -hmm. really relies par partially on exports and making sure that the goods our farmers produce, whether it's protein, grains, has an, has an international market. So what I would say is, you know, although there's a lot of complexity to a tariff, what we can always hope is that the farmer has a seat at that table. The voice of agriculture is being heard because, you know, they are the ones that with rural that, that helped elect him the first time, uh, helped on this re-election, and uh, they need to be at that table to make sure that we're finding the right balance between whatever we're trying to solve with the tariff and what it can mean for agriculture. Mm. So what would you say if at that table about what that appropriate balance is and who we perhaps need to be most careful about targeting with tariffs for fear of retaliation on the agriculture industry in the United States? Well, we've already seen a, an adjustment right now with, with what we used to be able to or were exporting to countries like China. That's already down quite a bit, and it's really affected our farmers in the Midwest. And this is you know several administrations all the way through where we're at and, and where we might be going. So I, I think the, the point that has to be made is we need to make sure the cause and effect has truly been balanced with what agriculture really needs and, and the cause and effect of that. We've seen margins come down substantially for our farmers. Now the good news is some expenses went down for them and the way they controlled their cost. And then we also had some good yields across the Midwest and across most of the country here. But in, in the reverse side, we've got to make sure that that both sides are being understood, whatever the solve is and whatever the cause and effect is to, uh, to agriculture, because uh, th those international markets are absolutely critical for companies like Landis and Conduit that are yeah. trying to move those goods out of our, our state, out of the Midwest, and, and get them into a position to go into a global market. And when you lose uh, a volume like we have to China, that, that has a long-term ripple effect, and, and it's hard to recover from. Well, how much have we lost? How much have farmers lost when it comes to exports to China? Set the baseline for us here, Matt, before we even begin the conversation about additional tariffs. Yeah, I think, you know, the, those numbers are always moving, and, and I haven't seen the, the latest, but I would say it's probably safe to say we're nearing around half of the exports that we used to see. I think there was an announcement wow. today or, or uh, earlier this week on Monday around uh, a new port that now uh, South America opened up, particularly for Brazil out of Peru, that China is very mm -hmm. excited about uh, taking imports uh, from, from Brazil or Peru, the South American market as a whole, and moving it over to China. So you know, there continues to be additional pressures that get put on. So it's not even where we're at, mm -hmm. but what are other opportunities that uh, some kind of a conflict could create that, uh, that, that now there's another alternative that we just weren't used to, and that port will mm -hmm. have an additional effect not just on what maybe happens in South America to China, but other parts of, of the world as well. So, uh, you know, today we're down quite a bit, and the future, particularly when you look at corn, looks a little more daunting as, as Brazil, particularly in South America, mm -hmm. has a, a wider path of what they can do with increased yields and more acres that they're farming than ever before. Well, Matt, as you talk about pressures, I wonder as well about cost pressures and inflation. I'm assuming uh, this industry has been grappling with this over the last uh, several years, as many have, and perhaps that's one of the reasons why this election resulted the way that it did. We, of course, have a lot of conversation about the way in which tariffs could lead to higher inflation. What would it mean for the agriculture industry not only to have the potential uh, retaliatory impact on the way in which the goods are being exported, but also the inflationary impact on if a tariff is placed on everything else, including equipment that they need, uh, need to actually uh, to actually get those yields, to farm that land, to do everything they need to do? Yeah, it all has an effect, right? And for our farmers that uh, that, that are, are engaged in this every day, they're, they're balancing, you know, volume with price, with their expenses. And I thought the farmers really have done a great job in 24. You know, luckily Mother Nature cooperated and we got uh, good yields out of, out of what we needed in most parts of the U.S., not all but most. They did a nice job as farmers really pulling back on equipment needs and, and trying to reduce the expense on that side. So when you add the volume and the expense reduction that the farmers were able to capitalize on, you know, they're, they're going to be able to get out of 24 in a good position. But nobody knows what 25 really brings. And, and that's the uncertainty that exists here is what will 25 bring from, uh, from, a, from a cost standpoint, 
uh, from a Mother Nature standpoint. So, and then you look at just interest line. Uh, some farmers have never even seen this kind of an interest level or cost on their P&L. And those are things mm -hmm. that are just adding additional pressure to the mix. So anything right now that, that adds additional pressure to our farmers is gonna have a, a big impact on them because we've taken a lot of those steps out mm -hmm. in 23 and 24. And now we've got to look to the future and, and continue to try to, to find some kind of win here. And that's where when you come back to exports and making sure our farmers yeah. have their goods that can go elsewhere, that's an important step. Well, Matt, this is an incoming administration that has promised uh, mass deportation and has also suggested that workplace raids might come with that. I know that that remains uh, a question at this point, and we may need to learn more about it from Donald Trump's uh, immigration officials, but to the extent to which farmers are reliant upon migrant workers, what impact would a mass deportation have on your industry? Well, it definitely has an impact. You know, as I think about the Midwest and just across all of agriculture, actually, it's still a very human intensity business that we're in. And I don't know if that's different from a lot of industries, but agriculture for sure is no exception to that. And as rural populations mm -hmm. continue to to fall in the amount that's out there, it makes it even more challenging. Now in the Midwest, H-2A workers have been a big part and a big part of the solution to how we've dealt with that and, and will continue to be as, as we go forward there. But there are other parts, you know, particularly in the western part of the United States, the southeast, where it's not just mm -hmm. H-2A, but others that they reach into. So again, I think getting that farmer's voice at the table will be essential because as rural continues to slide in its population, and, uh, and the workload is still there for manual or just humans in general, we, we've got to make sure that, the, that there's a balance there and that, that Ag's voice is heard. And with hopefully a soon appointment of USDA, uh, that that person will have the Ag background and have the, so to speak, dirt on their hands to be able to, to mm -hmm. reflect that and find the right balance that, uh, that Ag has that voice at the table and find that, that, that true balance.